This weekend, everyone went crazy over William mentioning Harry. Now, it was billed by a lot as a thawing of relations, but in my view, in the context it was placed, it would have been difficult to leave Harry out. In William's up-and-coming documentary, We Can End Homelessness, Prince William talks about his brother for the first time in years, despite their rift. William basically recalls how his mother, Princess Diana, took them both to homelessness shelters where, when they were young, which is what has shaped his passion for addressing the homelessness situation now. So in that context, he couldn't have pretended that he went on his own without his brother. Nonetheless, many thought that this indicated that there was a, an olive branch being reached, a thawing of relations, but I'm not convinced, given Harry's constant whinging and complaining, which, ironically, he can't seem to see that he thinks, whilst he's uh, defending Meghan from all the hurty words, he's chucked out quite a few of those towards Queen Camilla, the king's wife. Charles, of course, defending her just like Harry. Speaking of that book, of course, the paperback memoir of Spare is now coming out, of course, and it seems that uh, with all of these things being released, Harry and Meghan are now working their separate ways. Mm. Because to be fair to them, who can blame Harry for wanting to detach from everything uh, they do together? Because so far, everything they've done as a couple has failed. And when Meghan has done things on her own, like America Riviera Orchard, that has failed. But when Harry's been doing his stuff, he's been quite successful. So we shall see what happens with the pair. But one thing's for sure, I doubt that they'll get an invite for Christmas. Well, joining me now on GBN America is Angela Levin. Angela, welcome. Really good to talk to you. Thank you. Now, let's talk Prince Harry and Meghan Markle reportedly promoting their projects. They seem to be doing this separately due to, and I'll put this in speech marks, their toxic reputation. Uh, their joint kind of Sussex brand has gained this kind of reputation over the many years. That is according to the PR expert, Ed Conran Jones. So what are your thoughts on his opinion? I don't necessarily agree with him. He might be right, but I don't agree with him. I think it came out after they'd done their two false trips abroad. And you could see Harry was beside himself. He was so miserable. He was so unhappy. And Meghan was absolutely in top form, pushing him out the way. He wasn't involved. And at the second one, um, he was put at the wrong end of a table or a next table. Nobody came to speak to him. Meg, um, Megan was in the middle of the first table. Everyone was talking to her. And there he was, left all alone, oh. as if he didn't matter one inch. And I think something clicked. I mean, I'm used to all his faces and how he shows himself on his face. And he just had had enough. I think that's what happened. Do you but, think? Right. Do you yeah. think? I mean, I would attempt to try and defend Megan, you know, some of the things you said, but there are actual videos of her moving him out the way sort of thing. I mean, when they were yeah. standing to take that picture, she positively, and that's just from what I saw, shoved him out the way and then he ended up standing behind everybody. I mean, that's yeah. caught on camera. That, that didn't look good. No, but also if you were, you went with your husband or your partner or your wife, um, you wouldn't put them on a table that was with a lot of low-grade people. You would want them with them, surely, or else on another table where there would be other interesting people for him to talk to. But there was nobody for him to talk mm. to, really. I didn't make any effort. And I just thought, well, I thought he hated the whole thing. He tried to smile once or twice, but I think he was very unhappy. And then he thought, you know, um, he's had the, the feeling about coming back or doing the things. Mm. But he then went backwards. You know, he was doing all the, you know, sort of nine out of nine days, I think, um, places where he'd been before, as if to rejuvenate them. And I think it's the same that shame that he always looks backwards now. He still is looking backwards. And what you want is for him to move forward. But again, he had all these um, places to go to in London, in New York, and in America, uh, Afri Africa. And he um, got better as the week went on. Mm. First of all, he was sitting there with um, the Hallow Trust and 
the drama for uh, which his mother uh, was very keen on. And he was moving his hands around and sitting and feeling very, very uncomfortable. But as the days went on, he got more and more relaxed and he was actually enjoying himself. And he got very, very good um, response from the people he saw. And I think he was just building himself up. Um, it was very sad that um, Megan obviously didn't want to go to Africa with him because that was one of his key successes. Um, he started that when he was on his, um, just after school, and Charles um, found something for him to do which he thought would be really right, and that is to go to Africa and to help children who have been put in an orphanage because their parents have died from um, terrible um, illnesses. And um, he, he's done, he did very well there and he, he felt he loved it. He said to me that he liked to go there because children don't judge you. And I thought that was a really rather touching thing to say. Yeah. Um, and, and he was very happy there. Shame Megan didn't want to go because I think she could have felt very much proud of him. I don't know. You know, like you say it's a shame she didn't want to go. We don't know whether she did or she didn't. But I suspect that because there is a lot of negative energy that surrounded them ever since they became a couple and a lot of it is kind of targeted towards Megan but they're both just as bad as each other in my view the toxic element of it in many many would say would is Megan um it might be Harry we don't know the couple but on their own individually one of them does well and the other one doesn't and it's always Harry that does better on his own and Megan so far as I can see has done badly well, Megan is somebody who, I mean, I do know Harry well, actually. Mm. So I do make judgments about him that I recognize from the facial um, expressions on. Uh, but anyway, he, he, I think he tries very hard with children. He knows he's very good with children and he knows what he wants to do. Whereas Megan, she doesn't listen to people. She hires people, but then she doesn't really listen to them. And she does all sorts of things of organizing early um, and then leaving them. This is this terrible mm -hmm. sort of American Riviera orchard, which was actually originally done on April, in April. And we got no further. And that uh, coincided with, um, <laughs> Prince William coming out to do something about um, Diana's awards. Yeah. So you put two to do together, it might not have been that, but why on earth would you try and sell something that was nowhere near? You know, you hadn't got the trademarks passed, um, you hadn't got things organized. It was sort of ridiculous. You just send 50 out to your friends and nobody's heard anything more. Um, mm. It won't or the spring because there's so many things she wants to do so it's sort of getting excited about things but not actually going through them to the end and not also it did feel like the timings of these things were to coincide with something important happening in the royal family i mean what yeah. with the cancer diagnosis and things like that you would think as a mark of respect you might cut back on promoting financial things like america review era orchard and jams and and dog biscuits and all the other stuff. You think you think, oh, hang on, members of my family are ill, they're suffering with cancer. Kate, Catherine, and both the king, but yet that didn't really stall her at all. Not a good look at all. Let's talk about the upcoming ITV documentary, Prince William. Um, he's yeah. a weekend end homelessness. I know you touched on it. He speaks out about his brother. He mentions Harry, and everybody's jumped on it and says, "Wow, he's talking about Harry." Is this a defrosting of relations? No, I don't think it is. I mean, he started talking all about what his mother did with him, and I know that in detail. When they were, when he was eleven and Harry nine, she would take them to all these homeless places because she felt they had so much. Any toy you could imagine, any garden you wanted, you know, there was a, potentially spoiled, but she didn't actually spoil them. They had everything, and um, she wanted them to see people like that, and it was a real, real shock. And I think William is absolutely right. If he's telling the story from how it all began, um, to say one word, um, Harry, Harry was there. I mean, I think that's, um, he should have done that because he was there. It doesn't mean I forgive him and I want to be friends again. I don't think that that's involved at all. He just wanted to say what happened. And I think for the two of them to go there, they could share what they felt afterwards, the shock 
and the luck that they they had. And um, I don't think I don't think William would do that anyway now, because he's protecting his wife hugely, because she's still not completely okay. She's all right, but mm. she's got to be very careful. But also, Harry said this terrible statement that he has a great aim to help bring up the two children are not going to be king, right? Because his book was spare, he knows the hell he's been in, and he wants to take over so that it doesn't happen again. William has told him strictly, absolutely no. He says, I'm going to keep on trying. So um, I think um, William and Catherine's children are absolutely delightful. You can see that. In any case, any parent has the right to decide how they're going to bring up their children. Mm -hmm. And think that he was um, furious with Harry and the best way to stop that is not to see him. If you don't see him, he can't try and bring up your children. Um, I would be very scared, you know, what? take them away, let me tend, take them for a nice walk, um, you know, oh no, thank you. You know, you'd be very, very careful. And well, yeah, but no... you, you might be, I mean, look, to be fair, you, we all know Harry's very, very good with children, as it, it, it does seem that way. But it, it's more to do with the fact that whether, you know, if anything the children say or anything anyone says will not then end up on some sort of media platform, the theories, um, yeah. that, 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 that he'll, you know, talk. That's, the same. That's also it. You can't trust him because yeah. um, he does sell things and to make, yeah. uh, the less he's connected with the royal family, the more he needs to hear things so that he can earn money from them. But I do think that thing with the children is very important. He really wants to change how they're being brought up and make them um, so they don't become spare. I'm sure they won't. But even to inject that into their psyche as well, I think that's wrong because they're, they're not... It would never be in their psyche, really, because he, you know, because it's actually, they're not the spares at all. I think he's sort of missed the point here. They're not the spares. The spares will be William and Catherine's children. And then he's even further down every time they have another child. So his kids are not the spare. They are the complete spare, if anything, God or heaven forbid, anything, you know, happened to our, a lot of our members of the royal family. But even then, the British public, I don't think, would accept him. So I don't know what he would think there. But let's move on to Christmas, because what are they going to do over Christmas? Do we know any of the plans? Will Harry and Meghan well, be joining the wider family? Um, no, no, they won't be coming. They won't be, uh, they? Not going to be invited. Yeah, no <laughs> um, but the thing is, I think that it's... Um, they, I think they were waiting to see how the king... Uh, behaved in Australia, whether it was too much for him, whether it was too difficult, so that they wouldn't want a really loads of people there for Christmas. Um, but he, he loved it. He was thrilled. I mean, it was um, it gave him a good feeling that he was back in the world that he loves. Um, so he was did very well considering he's still having treatments. And don't forget, they stopped the treatments while he was away. Um, and he seemed absolutely fine. He looked fine. Once he closed his eyes and just almost fell asleep. But we can all do that if the time clock is different and all that. And I think they will start saying it now. And if they have a quiet Christmas, that's up to them too. Um, I think people shouldn't get hysterical mm. about where they're going for Christmas at this early stage. I know all the things are in the shops already, in London anyway. Um, Christmas cards and everything, but I, I think any um, cautious um, royal would know that let them get settled, make sure how he is, uh, get the treatment back up again, and then decide. I don't think it's a big deal. No, I don't either. Andrew Levin, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto. <laughs> Royal biographer Angela Levin. Uh, Richard, let's talk about King Charles. He is planning a full schedule. He's 75. He's got cancer, but he's still planning a full schedule going overseas and following all these sort of positive uh, uh, results that he got from his Australia tour. Tell me more. Well, this it's a very, very important uh, development, I think it's very positive. We know that the king has this very holistic approach to his work and his life generally, and there's no doubt that uh, the recent 
trip to Australia, Samoa, and of course, Chogum. I mean, that this was tremendously reviving for him, but it should be remembered that there was a free day when they, after they landed, there weren't evening engagements in Australia, and it was very, very carefully balanced by his doctors, and it's wonderful news that he feels free, apparently, to plan spring and autumn trips next year. We do have to just emphasize that, obviously, it depends on his doctor's advice, and that is so important. But yes, mm. it went splendidly, and indeed, I think it was considered something of a triumph, especially in that heat, and given the fact that he hasn't been used to doing anything like this uh, since his cancer diagnosis. I mean, he mm. hasn't been able, apart from D-Day, to uh, travel abroad. There's no question that I think he will see it as a personal triumph, and I think also he will be very grateful for Queen Camilla's help and support. I mean, there's no doubt that's been invaluable. Mm. I do love to see them together because they look like two little teddy bears together. You know, to the, I'll never forget that shot of them uh, during the coronation from behind, where you could sit, see them both sitting in that chair with their robes on and the crowd in front. Do you remember that shot? I was so well, involved. yes, and, and also, you know, it, it's, it's very much, you're right, the sort of like minds, a similar age, yeah. similar attitudes, similar sense of humour, similar friends. So, I mean, they are perfectly matched, good heavens, thinking back over the years mm. of all the problems that uh, occurred in the past is that's one thing but I think there's no question especially in a crisis and this has been a crisis and he seems to be coming through it splendidly and it is indeed partly due to her well and the doctors are quite confident with him doing that as well that he's on the road to recovery which which is lovely we don't hear much regarding Catherine and and her progress but you know obviously we all wish her uh, the best she's quite incredible isn't she brilliant woman um, what about um, the fact that Charles has done a lot of work? Like when he, when he was doing his trips, he was using a lot of energy and doing a lot. He, there were points where I thought he looked a little bit tired. Is he really up for it? Oh, I think there is. I think there's no doubt you're right. I think there were moments that he was tired, especially, and I don't think the Australians minded this at all, uh, when he got very impatient during uh, a reading of a speech with a couple of pages stuck together. But, I mean, 10,000 people at the Sydney Opera House uh, mm. waiting in the heat to see him, successful um, individual parts of the visit, where they was talking to scientists, visiting the botanical gardens, attending a barbecue at church service or reviewing the fleet. I mean, there's no doubt it was a wonderful mix. I'm sure he was tired, but on the other hand, there's no doubt at all that it, it has energised him. We know how much he loves working. Apparently, he's now eating half an avocado for lunch, but so the reports <laughs> have it. He wouldn't eat lunch before. He used to go for a walk. Oh. Apparently, according to some reports, he used to have tea, but between breakfast and sometimes between dinner, those who tried to catch up with him often had rather a problem. Oh, bless him. Bless him. What about Prince Harry? Let's talk about it. He has released the paperback edition of his memoirs, memoir Spare, or Where? Is that, uh, October the 24th was the day. Um, a lot of people have crit criticised him for doing that. Obviously, Charles and Camilla are on a royal tour. Where do you stand with that? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I strongly suspect that it was the publishers who mm -hmm. chose the date. Whether or not he tried to alter it, we simply don't know. We don't know if he chose it, but it is probable that the date coincided with the tour and that it was probably accidental because of the huge publicity spare received when it came out originally. We're thinking of the beginning of last year and those very destructive interviews uh, that he gave around it, including criticising Queen Camilla in ways that were totally unacceptable, oh, hence yeah. the fact that they were evicted mm -hmm. from Frogmore by an angry King Charles. 
I suspect that this, I mean, one thing one has to say about uh, the paperback of Smear, at least it didn't include anything new. We know that 400 pages, according to Harry anyway, uh, was, was originally cut out because it would be too sensitive. That was obviously a nasty threat. He didn't give interviews promoting the paperback, at least for this relief, a lot of thanks. I mean, whenever they're silent or doing their own thing and recently doing it quite successfully solo. So where will all this lead? Mm. And the fact that um, in a documentary on Homes uh, shown on ITV this week, um, we've got um, William talk or mentioning mm. Harry for the first time in six years. I mean, that is extraordinary. However, it is in the context of a visit in 1993 uh, with their mother to the passage. And it's part of uh, William's drive against uh, homelessness and trying to help the homeless, which of course is admirable. But just mentioning mm. Harry, it's quite extraordinary how deep the rift is. Uh, so we just mentioned that, but what it would lead to, if it leads to anything, is completely a huge question mark, obviously. Mm, well, he mentioned him, but it could have been, you know, you're saying, and then it was a slip of the tongue. He thought, oh, I've mentioned that toe rag again. <laughs> Well, actually, actually, no, we have to be fair here because no, we have to be fair simply because it was the caption of a photograph, mm. and it's in that context it was mentioned. And quite honestly, I mean, as you know, recently Harry was uh, forty, and the mile, the it was marked by good wishes from the royal family. It's the policy that they don't send good wishes to non-working royals uh, unless it's a milestone. When you're mm -hmm. 40, it's a milestone and that's all that could be read into that. And I don't, I personally suspect, even though I hope that something might, you never know, I don't think there's a great deal more to this. Yeah, oh, right, fair enough. And obviously, he's not a, a toe rag, is he? He's just a whinging sport brat. <laughs> that's what I really meant. <laughs> well, you wait till you see him on the polo field, apparently, oh, the net. Uh, there's a five-parter, so they've got five hours or something like that. Uh, it oh. must be. I haven't seen it, of course, but it hasn't launched on Netflix yet. But I think Harry will find that he won't get a huge audience. Firstly, he doesn't appear very much. And secondly, it's a very elitist sport. Most people can't afford to do polo even if they wanted to. Mm, it's just sort of like rubbing your face into something that you will never do. And he's showing you he does it. And... I, I, nobody even, I don't understand the rules. I've never been to a polo match and I would say probably 90% of the people who are watching this probably never been to one either. So I don't know what, why Netflix think it will be interesting, but we shall see. Richard Fitzwilliams, thank you so much. It's a pleasure.